Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a project update video for this vintage ArmorTech radio controlled German Tiger 1. Since the last video update, a lot of progress has been made to the model's interior and interior mounts, of which we'll be all going over in this video. Before I can go ahead and start fabricating the floorboards as well as the equipment mounts, the first area you need to pay attention to is that of the rear idler mounts. The rear idler mounts, like we mentioned in a previous video, are fully adjustable on the ArmorTech Tiger 1 kits. They utilize a long threaded bolt and that of a yolk. Now, when everything is all assembled, including when the track is mounted to the vehicle, the tension of the track is putting constant force towards the rear wall, which sandwiches the fastener and keeps everything firmly in place. The design works, however, one issue that can arise is that if the track ever snaps or becomes derailed and that track tension is lost, the Yolk has a bad habit on simply popping off of its mount like the way you see it here. When this happens, trying to get the piece back into its proper slot is a lot is very problematic specifically when the vehicle is fully built and detailed keep in mind this is a early production tiger one with that of the fifle system with the fifle system tubes in place getting access to the rear hinge door section and getting all the way in here to get access to the component to realign it is very troublesome to prevent this feature from happening on this build i went ahead and designed a idler retention cap system. The caps that you see here are a new set listed on the eastcoastarmory.com product line. The way they work is that they go in between the fastener and get mounted to the wall and they keep everything in place. A similar design was found on the other builds that I've done in the, in the past. However, this time here, I actually went ahead and made a mold of it. Now, as you can see, the hole in the center is drilled oblong and is that of a oval. The purpose of this is so that once it's mounted to the hull, there is some yawing going on when the piece is being tightened, specifically with the angle of the yolk. The oval simply allows room for this yawing to happen and prevents the fastener from grinding up against the sides of the hole. And here are the idler mounts now firmly attached to the model. As you can see, the way the component mounts to the tank is that of utilizing the fasteners for the armored cover caps. The fastener location holes are just used. And when everything is firmly mounted in place, as you can see, the mount ain't going nowhere. However, if I put in the wrench, I can still adjust the idler with no issues. For those who might be wondering if the resin is a durable enough material for this application, keep in mind that the way the tank is designed, all of the force and tension from the track as well as the RC riggers are being diverted directly backward into the rear plate. Absolutely no force is being exerted forward, which would be resting on the resin. The only purpose of the resin is to again is to just keep the component held in place in case track tension is lost and will prevent the swing arm here from falling out of its place and making it harder for it to be reinserted. Now to mount the fasteners as you see I did have to make a small modification to the rear plate of the armor tech kit. Like I said before, the set is designed to utilize the fastener locations for that of the armored cover caps. The armored cover caps are supplied with the kit and will be utilized. One modification that I made was that you need to have a fastener hold the component in place. And to do this, I, with the drill bit, I bored a hole into the rear plate in order for the fastener to, when it gets bolted on, is nice and flush. As you can see with the fasteners that are flush, they will not alter the fit of the cover cap in any which way. The reason for doing it this method is that if the cover cap is removed, there could be a chance of the fastener slipping and the whole unit undoing itself, which kind of negates the purpose of the entire modification. Also, in case anyone is wondering, on the real Tiger 1, the fasteners on these locations here 
emerge from the vehicle in the same exact way. On the real tank, the cover cap simply th slides onto the threaded rods and then two nut fasteners are then used to bolt the component to the tank. So this modification actually helps with the accuracy of the build. As if anyone noticed that the thread on the fasteners are very long, this is temporary and as soon as the cover caps start getting fitted to the vehicle, they will be trimmed to the appropriate lengths. With the tank now at the point where the interior equipment needs to be added to the model, I went ahead and started fabricating that of the equipment subfloor. Now subfloors are absolutely required on German World War II radio control tanks for the simple reason that on the bottom panel of the German World War II tanks you have the torsion bars which run along the bottom portion of the hull. With this style of a suspension system, equipping, mounting the equipment to the floor is problematic if not impossible. And that is where the subfloor comes in handy. Now subfloors aren't anything new. Armortech, the current generation of Armortech German tanks do supply you with a aluminum subfloor. However, on the first generation German Tiger One kits from Armortech, the subfloors were not included. This was due to the fact that the original design of the motion packs were really designed to be mounted on the tank sponsons and rear of the vehicle. The kits did originally supply you with a small little subfloor in order to mount the batteries to the battery tray. However, rather than using the kit supply battery tray, I went ahead and replaced all of the subfloor mounting systems that were the original kit with that of this new one that you see here. As for the actual subfloor itself, for the media that the component is fabricated in, I went ahead and went with my usual construction method, which is that of clear Lexan polycarbonate plastic that is reinforced with aluminum strip angle. The aluminum is bolted directly to the Lexan in a cradle style format, which gives the plate a lot more rigidity compared to just having the plate without the reinforcement straps. As for why I like to go with this media for this application, that's simple. The, this media here has lots of benefits compared to other materials such as aluminum or even wood. First is that of lightness. The setup that you see here is very light. The advantage of that is that the tank is already heavy to begin with. With replacing some of the heavy materials with lighter materials gives a little bit less of baggage that the drivetrain, motors, and batteries have to haul around now. Also, the component itself is very, very, very strong. This material here is more than strong enough for the application at hand. And third, since the material is made out of a clear plastic, this allows you to see through the floor pan at the torsion bars and allows the operator to see if there's any issues going on with the torsion bars in case there's any need for emergency or any type of maintenance that needs to occur. If something were to happen to the torsion bar and you need to get access to it, you can visually see where the problem lies rather than having to remove this component with all the other equipment that's strapped to it. And here we have the Armortech first generation smoke system. The smoke system that you see here was originally offered by Armortech and this is the design which would have been found on their early production vehicles. If we look, we will notice that the design is very similar to that of what we see on their contemporary kits. However, on this version here, it's a more primitive form. Even though this system is considered more primitive compared to the modern unit, the layout and the function is almost identical. We have here the actual tub that contains the, the filament as well as the wick. We have a lid. We have a steel mounting plate, PVC tube, the wick mat, some copper fittings, some brass fittings, a turned nylon bushing, a heat insulator, a thinner piece of vinyl tubing, bag of fasteners, as well as the actual heating element and the propelling fan. 
Really the main difference between the first gen and the current generation units is that of the size. If we notice the first units are a lot bigger in comparison to the modern units which are approximately three quarters of the size of this bigger unit. The smaller units on the more modern ones are better in that they conserve less space on the inside of the vehicle which once you start adding a lot of components and functions free space on the model gets eaten up pretty quickly. Having said that though, this unit here will be assembled and used on the model. It's also very interesting to see how Armored Tech evolved the unit from the original setup that we have here. And here's the floorboard now fully complete and ready for installation to the model. What separates the, or what was added to the floorboard to get it up to these conditions was I went ahead and added the mounting hole fasteners for that of the columns which are mounted onto the tank itself. In addition to fasteners, the smoke system is permanently bolted to the plate. As well as we have two other longer fasteners sticking out of the front here. These fasteners that you see here are for the main Armatech power box, which will be mounted in this location here. Now, the same system was done on the smoke system. The threads of the screws are actually poking out through the bottom. The purpose of this is that when it comes time to mount the piece, you simply slide the component over the fasteners and with the nuts, you simply bolt it to the floorboard. This is a departure from my more, or from my older units in which you would have to bolt the pieces on prior to the installation of the panel. With this system here, the fastener is threaded directly into the Lexan, Loctite is added, keeping the pieces firmly in place which then makes it the installation of the components and removal of the components if there's an emergency much more easily compared to the older setup. And here is the tanks hull now ready for the floorboards to be added. As you can see since prior to the addition of the floor pan I went ahead and added the mounting fasteners along with column supports in order to act as spacers to mount on the floor pan. The floorboards on the bottom portion of these tanks are very important that they are elevated and are not making contact with the torsion bar. If we could go back to one of my earlier builds, namely that of the Armor Tech Panther, you'll see that originally when that model was built, the builder went ahead and mounted the Armor Tech battery tray with the columns to the back portion here of the suspension. The, however, these columns were not long enough and when everything was bolted together, the floor pan actually went ahead and made contact and restricted on top of the torsion bar, thus causing the tank to run poorly. It is absolutely important that these torsion bars remain untouched in order for them to operate properly. Just like with the floorboards, which were showcased earlier, for this build, I went ahead and permanently mounted the fasteners directly to the lower pan. The reason for this is that when it comes time to mounting on the floorboards, if the fasteners are just left to dangle, it's going to be a little difficult in fiddling with everything in order to get everything in place and everything mounted on. By permanently affixing the fasteners to the hull, this speeds up construction quite a bit. As for the standoff, since there is a nut found on the bottom portion of the pan, a small recess was machined into the bottom portion here of the column. So when the piece slips on, it is a flush fit and there is no gap or wobble to the component. All of the columns that you see here are done in the exact same manner. The column, the column layout is also designed not to interfere with any of the equipment layout and are also designed to distribute the weight of the equipment evenly throughout the bottom portion of the hull. And here we have the floorboard now mounted to the model. Now all the fasteners have been added and a very tiny drop of Loctite was added to the fasteners for nothing more than just to keep them in place. However, if they need to be removed, a simple torque of the wrench will easily overcome the small amount of Loctite which was utilized. In this configuration now, I can go ahead and install the batteries. They lock into their little track. Once the batteries are in the track, simply take the Velcro strap, strap it over the batteries. Now, 
before the build goes any further than the point in this scene, protectors will be added to the contacts in order to prevent any sort of accidental short circuits, which can possibly happen if anything makes contact with these leads. However, for now, the batteries are in place. And I will now take the power supply and speed controller set up and mount it to the tool post. As you see, the system just drops right in. And with two nuts, I simply go ahead and bolt them on. Now, like the other components, Loctite will not be utilized for this location here, as it's not necessarily as critical for vibration to loosen the fasteners as they are on the other portions of the build. And if Loctite is going to be used, I'll more likely use low-strength blue Loctite for this purpose. And there we go. The component is now fitted. Obviously, the wires need to be cleaned up, but the basic layout is starting to take shape. With the floorboards and the smoke system now mounted to the tank, it's now time to start filling in the rest of the rear hall area. Starting with first the wells for that of the fan system. This tank here will be utilizing the EastCoastArmory.com Tiger One fan clusters. These have been used in several builds in the past and do give the vehicle a very nice and unique detail punch. Now, because this tank does have a FIFO system, no interior engine compartment detailing will be added to this build. However, even though no interior engine compartment detailing will be added, you still need to go ahead and fabricate the hull well areas for that of the fan compartment as like was seen on the other builds. The Tiger One's rear hull section was, car uh, was segmented and had several compartments compared to just having just a large open well in the back. For the actual compartments themselves, I went ahead and fabricated them out of sections of Lexan. There are two wells that have been fabricated. The wells themselves are eighth inch Lexan construction. The tube that you see here is a column support and will help with the mounting to the vehicle. Now this tube is not present on the real Tiger One, however I'll go into that a little bit later shortly. As, as you know, there is a right and left hand side, as you can see, and they have been pre-primed and painted. They also have been pre-fitted to the model just prior to getting them into their prime. To mount the pieces to the hull, I went ahead and modified the Armortech kit by mounting on two strips of aluminum angle. The aluminum angle are bolted directly to the side hull of the model. Now, in order to bolt them on, I first had to drill a hole into the side armor plate. The hole does not go all the way through, and once the hole was drilled, it was then tapped with the same threading for the fasteners that were utilized. By doing this, you have a nice, very strong permanent bond, and the piece has no play to it. And you, by not drilling it all the way through, you do not hinder or ruin the model's detail accuracy, which would be suffering if you had fasteners exposed on the opposite side. As for mounting the pieces on, this is facilitated by three countersunk fasteners which are located on the bottom plate here of the extended sponson. Now if we notice they're countersunk because once the pieces get bolted on the radiator needs to sit nice and flush to this component and if there's any exposed fastener heads the radiator cluster will sit higher than need be and that can cause some issues. The piece simply locks into place like this and the three fasteners get bolted to the floor and then two more fasteners are going to be bolted to the side here. The little piece of angle that we have here is that of thick ABS plastruct and again the fasteners are go, are go ahead and tapped into the rear armor plate thus keeping everything firmly in place. Now the purpose of the tube that we have here is to be used as a column support in order to prevent any type of flexing and also to keep the piece firmly in its location even once it's added from these locations here. With the column you have three points of contact with the tank's hull thus ensuring for a nice sturdy and strong mounting. Now here we can see the column in more view. The column itself bolts directly to the outside of the tank via a single fastener. This fastener here will be deleted once the bodywork is done and the piece is 
permanently mounted in place. Now, on the real Tiger One, this column is not absent, as on the real Tiger One, this compartment here is connected to a firewall which separates the engine bay compartment to the crew compartment interior. Since that firewall is not needed on this build, the column will make do for its replacement. Now, on the real Tiger One, this area here does have a large gas tank which is mounted in this location. However, the gas tank is plated over with that of a sheet metal air intake air duct. The air duct covers the gas tank and so the gas tank detailing is not seen, thus will not be detailed and added to this model. With the air duct in the way, the column is completely concealed and is hidden from view. Here are the fan compartments, now completed and ready for the next step. They have been bolted to the hull with the fasteners which were mentioned in the previous scene. Also added with that of some detail sculpted weld beads running along the side and rear of the firewall. Also we have here in the middle is a small little bracket. The bracket is also found on the other side and is a mirror image. The purpose of the bracket is to mount on the fan work they get mounted to the hull via some fasteners, which would be on the real tank on the sponson, and to secure them to the rear plate, that's facilitated with this bracket over here. Now, if we notice, there's a small hole in the center of the bracket. This would have originally have been for a hydraulic ram, which would have opened and closed the rear grill work, that, which is hinged, in order to allow more air to cool the system. This design was a carryover from the initial Tiger One design, which was designed by Henschel. However, the hydraulic system was never actually incorporated or even developed. However, the bracket design stayed in production all the way throughout the Tiger One's production life, from the initial production all the way up to the final production units. And here are the fans, now temporarily fitted to their fan locations. Like I mentioned earlier, there's a small little bracket found on the plate and the two pegs lock into the corresponding holes which are found in the front portion of the fan clusters. Now there will be a few more fittings and smaller details which will be added to the clusters which are not seen in this clip here, namely that of the filler cap as well as some plumbing detailing and more information on that will come in an upcoming update video. Moving our way from the fan bay areas takes us to the upper deck bulkheads. Now this model is unique in that it features a set of very rare aftermarket CNC aluminum bulkheads from a company which was known as Panzer Technic. Panzer Technic was around from the early to mid 2000 period and they offered a very limited range of components specifically intended to upgrade Armortech Tiger 1s. The bulkhead set that you see here was one of those. The set contained a rear and a front bulkhead CNC aluminum beams. As you can see, the pieces are very nicely machined and have the appearance that are found on the real Tiger 1s. The, re the rear and front bulkheads are location specific due to the way the sponson rises up on the front of the Tiger One series. Now with the addition of these components, these do deviate from the original kit. The original kit for mounting on the top deck had a very large single piece laser cut steel plate which would have been bolted to the steel upper deck which would lock onto the sponsons and preventing the turret from dipping due to the weight. In addition to that, there are also several other angle points which would be bolted to the sides of the hull, which would then further anchor the top deck on the stock model in place. That design is basically still the same on the original, or on the new current generation of Armored Tech Tiger 1s. However, what has changed is the use of that very large bulkhead. With the newer generations of Armor Tech Tiger 1s, they went ahead and redesigned the upper deck to use alloy plate. When they did that, they also deleted the large single steel bulkhead which ran across 
And the new current generations of Armor Tech Tigers feature a interior bulkhead layout, which is very similar here to the old Panther Technic one. So this set here is superfluous on the more recent generations of Armor Tech Tigers. As for these pieces here, from what I understand, they are quite rare as Panzer Technic was not around for very long and they were such a small niche market that the, not many of these components were actually fabricated. So it's actually very unique experience to come across a set of these still left in the raw on this build here. As for mounting these components to the model, these parts here get mounted directly and permanently to the side of the hull. There are absolutely no mount provisions for mounting this to the top deck, and these components never leave the hull. They are mounted on via six fasteners, which are pre-drilled and tapped, which are found on the sides of the bulkhead, three per each side. Now, since these pieces here are outside of the Armor Tech kit. There are no stock provisions for mounting these components found on the Armor Tech plates, so careful measurements need to be exhibited by the builder in order to get these components mounted on. The mounting is very important in that both the rear and the front spacing needs to be just right. Due to the large turret hole that's found on the top deck, you do not want to have the bulkhead run across short, which will interfere with the turret. Obviously, that is way less than ideal, and you're going to have to hit the drawing board again if that happens. In addition to the hole being in the right place, you also have to have the bulkhead themselves with the correct pitch. Due to the shape of the sponson, if you mount it flush to the sponson, the component's going to be in an angle, which is also less than ideal. You have to have it just enough for the plate to sit perfectly flat. In addition to that, you also have to have the alignment of the component perfect so that when the top deck sits on, it is at the perfect seamless height with the end of the upper hull and does not protrude or maybe even be shifted if the components are not bolted to the tank in the correct way. So measurements on for insulation these components are absolutely crucial. Now like I said before this is kind of not needed on the more recent generation kits as these components are supplied with the Armored Tech kit these days and are designed to be mounted directly to the top deck which simply drops directly to the lower hull. And here are the bulkheads now primed and mounted to the model's hull. Now one modification that I did make to the rear bulkheads was that of the small little notches that are found on this portion here of the bulkhead lip. We notice it is found on both sides. The purpose of these notches was to allow clearance of the fasteners which are found on the top deck which secure the large grill work to the top deck via fasteners. When I tested on the top deck, I saw that a small portion of the lip here went into the location where those fasteners were going to be present. So I simply marked where the fasteners would go and with a Dremel, I went ahead and removed material from these specific locations to allow the fasteners easy clearance once installed to the top deck. Moving our way to the front takes us to this bridge section here. The reason why I added this is that this portion here is going to eventually become the control panel as well as mounting points for some more equipment. More information is to follow in the next upcoming video. As for the bridge itself, it is made out of the exact same construction method which is used on the floorboards which is used to mount on the some of the other equipment. Again, more information on which equipment is going to be mounted in the hull is to follow. With the interior bulkheads now mounted to the model, I can now pop the top deck on without any fear of it nose diving into the lower hull. And not only with just that of the deck, I can also now put the turret onto the vehicle like you see here. Like I mentioned before, a lot of care had to have been exhibited when it came to finding out exactly where the bulkheads get mounted as the top deck needs to be exactly parallel with that of the 
armor plate. As you can see from the measurements I took, everything is exactly where it needs to be, and the top deck fits on perfectly with the body. Like I mentioned earlier, the bulkheads are affixed to the model with that of three fasteners per each side per bulkhead. The fasteners are countersunk directly into the side armor plate. Now the armor plates on the Armor Tech Tiger ones are thick enough in order to allow for you to remove some material in order to have the fasteners sunk below the surface. With, with this layout here, I will now go ahead and remove the exposed fastener locations and sand everything in with the bodywork, making for a nice flush side hull appearance. Another cautionary bit of info that I mentioned earlier in regards to the bulkheads had to do with regards to the turret. With the turret removed, you can see what I was referring to in better detail. With the large diameter turret ring that is found on the Tiger One, you don't want to have the bulkhead anywhere close to its proximity here, as obviously it can cause issue with that of the turret equipment and also the turret rotation. One area that some people may forget about is that of the actual motor that turns the, and rotates the turret. That motor is located in this section over here and it can be seen right now with these two holes which are found on the top deck. It is very easy to forget about this bit of equipment and when mounting in the bulkheads you may mount them too far close to the component which is going to cause issues with that of the bracket and can lead to issues down the road with the build. So this is something to keep in mind. I strongly recommend that when, if having to use any of these bulkhead sets for one reason or another, is when you're trying to do the layout, find the actual bracket for the turret rotation, fit it in place in order to make sure you have the proper clearance. With the interior bulkheads and other equipment mounts now mounted inside of the model, I can now progress with start filling in the interior with its other mechanical components. More information on these will be discussed in the next upcoming video. And with that, that concludes this project update video for this 1-6 scale radio-controlled Armortech German Tiger 1. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook. And don't forget to check out eastcoastarmory.com for more 1-6 and 1-16 scale builds and detail components. Thank you.